Hello and welcome to Close Reading Classic Literature with me, Dr Octavia Cox. Today I'm going to be looking at Virginia Woolf's commentary on Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre, which was first published in October 1847, and Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights, published in the same year, December 1847. And this is from Woolf's collection of essays from The Common Reader, published in 1925. The Common Reader was published by the Hogarth Press, and the Hogarth Press is the press, the publishing house, that Virginia Woolf ran with her husband, Leonard Woolf, from their dining table. Virginia Woolf is a celebrated novelist in her own right. You may have heard of Mrs Dalloway, for example, published in 1925, or To the Lighthouse, or Orlando, or The Waves, uh, published later, 1931. But Virginia Woolf is also an astute literary critic. Woolf, then, is a practising novelist, and in this essay we see her examining and analysing other novelists, which I think is really revealing, both in terms of understanding Woolf, if you're interested in Woolf, and understanding the Brontes, Charlotte Bronte and Emily Bronte, if you're interested in uh, Jane Eyre and Wuthering Heights. So in the essay that I'm concentrating on today, on Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre and Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights, Virginia Woolf, I think, really gets to the heart, to the essence, you might say, of what makes these two novelists so majestic and so intense and what we are drawn to in them as readers. What Wolfe particularly focuses on is working out and interrogating what is the, the core of these two writers, what makes them so distinctively themselves. What are their writing's most intrinsic qualities? Their quintessences, if you will. Wolfe also discusses the fundamental, as she sees it, difference between the two sisters. So the difference in aim, uh, in scope and in the focus of their writing. And I think that in this essay, Wolfe captures something really helpful in understanding the two novelists. So let's see then if you agree with Virginia Woolf's analysis of Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre and Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights. So Wolf starts by talking about Charlotte Bronte um, and she looks at the biography and how the biography impacts on how we interpret her novels. We find it difficult to kind of dissociate Charlotte Bronte from the image of the Yorkshire Wars, the, the wild Yorkshire Wars that she lived on. And Wolf writes, when we think of her, we have to imagine someone who had no lot in our modern world. We have to cast our minds back to the 50s of the last century, to, re to a remote parsonage upon the wild Yorkshire Moors. In that parsonage and on those moors, unhappy and lonely in her poverty and her exaltation, she remains forever. These circumstances, as they affect her character, may have left their traces on her work. So you can see the qualities that Charlotte Bronte's biography, we might bring to our understanding of her work. So the wild Yorkshire moors, the unhappiness and the loneliness and the poverty and the exaltation. Wolf goes on to describe Charlotte Bronte as an exhilarating read, that you feel ex exhilarated when you read Jane Eyre. She says, nor is this exhilaration short-lived. It rushes through the entire volume without giving us time to think. So for Wolf, then, Jane Eyre is not about thinking, but about being swept up in the story. It gives you no time to think and it rushes you through the, the feeling in the uh, exhilaration of the storytelling. For Wolf, Charlotte Bronte prioritises the expression of the self and it's that quality, that expression of the self that is made sort of awe-inspiring, made sublime. And here we might think of the high romantic uh, 
term the egotistical sublime. So that's a, a term that was coined by John Keats in a letter of October 1818, and he uses it in reference to William Wordsworth. But more generally, it can be applied to a kind of high romanticism which promotes the ego to the sublime. So the egotistical sublime is thinking about the self, the ego, in terms of inspiring awe or, or, or sort of greatness. So if something is sublime, then it's awe-inspiring. It's a kind of greatness beyond comprehension, a greatness beyond reason, a greatness beyond understanding. And the egotistical sublime promotes the ego, promotes the self to this kind of sublime level, which is beyond comprehension. So Wolf writes, the writer has us by the hand, forces us along her road, makes us see what she sees. This is the idea of the, the egotistical sublime. Never leaves us for a moment or allows us to forget her that she's an author who's very present in her writings for Wolf. At the end, we are steeped through and through with the genius, the vehemence, the indignation of Charlotte Bronte. So we have this idea of a, a particular sublimity to Charlotte Bronte's genius and also a sense of indignation and Indignation is a kind of immediate feeling. Indignation is a, is a sort of immediate flurry. If you fear, fear, kind of immediate fury. If you feel indignation, if you feel indignant, that I think is a quite immediate emotion. So if you're indignant about something, then you're feeling in that moment a kind of fury, a kind of anger, a kind of hot emotion indignation might cool into something like resentment. So resentment is a kind of colder passion or a, a longer passion, even if it's just as intense. It doesn't have the immediacy, I think, that is implied in the word indignant. And that matters. We'll see why that comes to matter later in the way that Wolfe continues to describe Charlotte Bronte. Wolf then goes on to compare Charlotte Bronte to novelists of a fundamentally different sort, those who look outwards. So Wolf writes, the characters of a Jane Austen or of a Tolstoy, so that's um, Leo Tolstoy, uh, author of Anna Karenina, War and Peace, uh, and so on. The characters of a Jane Austen or of a Tolstoy have a million facets compared with these. They live and are complex by means of their effect upon many different people who serve to mirror them in the round. So Austin and Tolstoy are authors who look outwards. They look on many different people and they look in the round. Sort of, they look at everything external to them. And according to Wolfe, they have a million facets compared to what Charlotte Bronte brings to her writing. So the characters of Jane Austen or of Tolstoy, they, their characters, move hither and thither, whether their creators watch them or not. And the world in which they live seems to us an independent world which we can visit now that they have created it by ourselves. And this is really, I think, a sense that you get when you read Austen, that she creates this world in which the characters seem to live and exist outside of whether or not the narrative voice happens to notice that they have done a particular thing or not. They seem to exist outside of what we are explicitly told about them. So according to Wolf, then, Austen and Tolstoy create worlds where the characters seem to exist beyond the author as well as the narrative voice within the text itself. Not so for Charlotte Bronte. Wolf says that Charlotte Bronte, in contrast, has a, 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 a narrowness of vision, she goes on to call it, 
I don't think she means this as a criticism. I think it's more a narrowness of vision or a kind of intensity of focus might be a more positive spin on it. A real kind of intensity and urgency to the narrow focus, the narrow vision that she happens to have. Like a Thomas Hardy, Charlotte Bronte has, as I've said, this intense, egotistical for the, the wolf focus. Thomas Hardy is more akin to Charlotte Bronte in the power of his personality, the power of his personality and the narrowness of his vision. So likewise then for Wolf, Charlotte Bronte has a power. The, her personality has a power and her vision has a um, intensity, a narrowness, a focus to it. Wolf then goes on to describe Charlotte Bronte's essential force. She does not attempt to solve the problems of human life. She is even unaware that such problems exist. And this is in contrast to a writer perhaps like, uh, you know, a, a satirical writer like Jonathan Swift, someone who is writing to change society, someone who wants to change the social, political, uh, whatever it, power structures and actively interrogate those and actively bring about change through their writing. For Wolf, Charlotte Bronte is not one of those writers. She's not attempting to solve the problems of human life. And the human life there, I think, is important because the problems of human life suggest perhaps the structures of society or the structures of uh, power dynamics or something like that, 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 that need to be solved. She does not attempt to solve the problems of human life. So that's not to do with the kind of essence of humanity, that's to do with living. Virginia Woolf continues, All her force, and it is the more tremendous for being constricted, goes into the assertion, I love, I hate, I suffer. So for Woolf, the power of Bronte is the intensity of feeling and conveying the intensity of that feeling and describing that passion and about the passion of the individual. I love, I hate, I suffer. The kind of egotistical sublime, going back to that idea, the idea of the individual and their feelings and how intensely they feel those feelings. That for Wolf is the, the main feature or the essential force of Charlotte Bronte's writing. For the self-centred and self-limited writers have a power denied the more Catholic and broad-minded. So in this sense, broad-minded being those who focus on um, external people. The self-centred and self-limited writers look within. So self-centred, self-limited. That means confined to the individual. Their impressions, so the self-centred and self-limited writers' impressions, are close-packed and strongly stamped between their narrow walls. Again, this idea of the narrowness of the vision. Nothing issues from their mind which has not been marked with their own impress. Such writers look within themselves for inspiration and all their writing then is an expression of self. Even if that self is uh, filtered as it so happens into different characters. Charlotte Bronte has an obstinate integrity, Wolf writes, and writes a prose which takes the mould of her mind entire. So this goes back to the idea of the egotistical sublime which I was talking about, which was coined, as I've said, by John Keats. In the same letter, so in a letter of October 1818, Keats writes about the chameleon poet or the chameleon writer, and he alludes particularly to Shakespeare, but I think it applies to to novelists like Austen as well, who focus to a much greater extent on character. So the chameleon poet inhabits external entities. The, I, the sort of imagery of the chameleon poet is that they take on whatever is around them and they, they put on the dress of whatever it is that they're sort of adopting at that time, according to Keats, it could be that they fill up the sun or that they fill up the moon or whatever it is. But for 
um, a writer like Austen, a novelist, that means that they inhabit their characters and they sort of allow their characters to go to the fore, to be at the forefront, rather than the authorial self. So in that letter, Keats writes that the chameleon poet has as much delight in conceiving an Iago as an Imogen. Those are references to Shakespeare's plays. Iago is from Othello and he's symbolic of uh, a kind of Machiavellian uh, manipulation. And almost in the complete contrast is uh, Imogen. She's from Cymbeline and she's the epitome basically of a kind of virtuous put upon uh, figure. And the chameleon poet delights in both of those and lives in both of them and delights in, in playing with the Machiavellian and the manipulative as in Aniago, but also just as much delights in playing with the virtue and the um, put uponness of a character like Imogen. And both those characters are just as believable. You don't get a sense of an author, of a self-centred and self-limited author behind those characters. They sort of stand believably as characters. As Wolf said earlier, those characters seem to us to live in an independent world, which we can visit that has been created so that they they seem to be alive beyond the text in which they happen to inhabit. Virginia Woolf continues that we read Charlotte Bronte for her poetry. And poetry here means not literally poetry as in a form, but poetry as in the kind of high romanticism idea of the poetical. And the poetical is uh, essentially what is sublime. What suggests this kind of awe-inspiring greatness that's slightly unfathomable, slightly untouchable, and that there are some things which are inherently more poetical than other things. And so Wolf is, is drawing on that and saying we read her for that quality in her, that slight poetical unfathomableness, otherworldliness. And part of the poetry that we read her for is her un tamed ferocity and primal energy. So this is what Wolf writes. We read Charlotte Bronte not for exquisite observation of character, so we don't read her for her characters. Her characters are vigorous and elementary. Elementary here means um, uh, primal, I suppose. They're not drawn with a kind of fine brush. The famous Austinian fine brush that she works on on, on a small piece of ivory. Not that kind of um, character, but vigorous and elementary. Not for comedy, hers is grim and crude. Not for a philosophic view of life, so we don't read her for her characters or for her comedy or for, you know, philosophy, for some grand ideas. Hers is that of a country parson's daughter, her philosophy is, but for her poetry. Probably that is so with all writers who have, as she has, an overwhelming personality. So that, as we say in real life, they have only to open the door and make themselves felt. So you feel her authorial character. You feel Charlotte Bronte as you are reading the text. That it is the, the stamp of Charlotte Bronte all over it. She isn't removed from the text. Going back to the idea of the chameleon poet isn't removed from the text in a way that you might feel in a in a Shakespeare play, for example. There is in them, so writers like Bronte, some untamed ferocity perpetually at war with the accepted order of things, which makes them desire to create instantly rather than to observe patiently. So this is going back to the idea of solving the problems of human life or not and what the, the aim or focus of a writer is. That Bronte is not a writer who observes patiently and we might think of this more as a writer like Jane Austen who has narrative voices who are far more detached 
they're far, their voice is far more detached from the action. Wolf here is saying that Charlotte Bronte, returning to the idea that Charlotte Bronte is not writing to change society, to change the problems of human life, which you might say to some extent that Austen does. She writes satire. So Wolf talks about Bronte's desire to create instantly and that is the sense of immediacy I think that you get with Wolf's earlier point about the indignation. That her writing is about instantaneous feeling and pouring out of the feeling of the moment and you know Jane Eyre is in the first person, it is an autobiography, it says that in the title of the book Jane Eyre and Autobiography and you do get a real <laughs> sense when you read it of a kind of emotional intensity, an immediate emotional intensity and that being a real part of the purpose of the novel and understanding what the novel means, what it's about. This very ardour rejecting harsh shades and other minor impediments, wings its way past the daily conduct of ordinary people and allies itself with their more inarticulate passions. So something deeper within than the surface level of polite articulation and the conduct of ordinary people. And Austin very much is a writer who focuses on the conduct of ordinary people and in the articulation and the subtleties and the nuances of the articulations of ordinary people which she observes patiently and unpicks dexterously. Wolf is saying that Bronte is not, Charlotte Bronte is not one of those writers. It makes them poets or if they choose to write in prose intolerant of its restrictions, that is the restrictions of prose, that they're intolerant of those restrictions. And I think you can see that, for example, in the uh, the uh, episode of the telepathy, which happens towards the end of Jane Eyre, where Mr. Rochester calls out in the middle of the night, Jane, 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 and Jane Eyre sort of telepathically, magically hears him from miles and miles and miles away. Now that, you might say, is breaking the restrictions of prose writing, of novel writing, because it is unrealistic, <laughs> because it breaks the rules of realism. But for Charlotte Bronte, Wolfe is suggesting that that just doesn't matter, that the passion, the, the point of that moment is more important. So suggesting that these are two souls who hear each other, you know, across space and time essentially that these two souls who communicate when they're apart from each other that they are fundamentally united and ought to be together even if they aren't physically together that is the point that Charlotte Bronte is trying to make in that moment the ardour of that the and so the the harsh shades and the minor impediments of the restrictions of prose writing don't matter to her at all in that moment. So going back to the past, the daily conduct of ordinary people, then we can see this as a rejection in some sense of realism for Wolf. Wolf then starts to compare Charlotte Bronte and Emily Bronte, especially in their use of nature imagery. Hence it is that both Emily and Charlotte are always invoking the help of nature because they are intolerant of the restrictions of conventional novelistic prose writing, that they draw on nature, they invoke the help of nature. They both feel the need of some more powerful symbol. So nature as a symbol of something else, not an accurate depiction of the natural world, but nature as a symbol, as a powerful symbol of the vast and slumbering passions in human nature than words or actions can convey. So it's kind of outside of the particulars of words and actions, outside of the particulars of ordinary everyday life, sort of beyond the mere human and invoking nature as a symbol of something inarticulate beneath. Both Charlotte Bronte and Emily Bronte, according to Wolf, she, both of them, calls in nature to describe a state of mind which could not otherwise be expressed. But neither of the sisters observed nature accurately, as Dorothy Wordsworth observed it, 
So this is not real life nature, but nature as symbol. And they don't observe it accurately as Dorothy Wordsworth observed it, or paint it minutely as Tennyson painted it. So they don't articulate, they don't observe nature accurately and they don't paint it minutely. Instead, nature is a symbol. They seized those aspects of the earth which were most akin to what they themselves felt or imputed to their characters. And so their storms, their moors, their lovely spaces of summer weather are not ornaments supplied to decorate a dull page or display the writer's powers of observation. They carry on the emotion and light up the meaning of the book. So the symbol of nature, the way that nature as a symbol is brought into both of their works, carry on the emotion and light up. So they elucidate, they illuminate the meaning of the book. The symbolism of the nature is part of the meaning of the book. It's not a kind of extra decoration on the top. That symbolism is part of understanding what they are both writing about. And essentially, we can call this pathetic fallacy. So pathetic fallacy was first coined after both of these books had been published. It was coined by John Ruskin in his uh, book, Modern Painters from 1856. And as the name suggests, it was about painting or about landscape uh, of nature rather than necessarily initially about writing. But it came to be applied to writing because it's a very useful term. It means essentially it's a kind of a assuming an equation between the writer's mood and the world around them or the writer's mood and the environment around them. George Eliot, a, a novelist, a Victorian novelist, um, also has a very apt definition, I think, which she uh, came out with in 1856 too, in a review of Ruskin's um, Modern Painters. She said, pathetic fallacy is the transference to external objects of the spectator's own emotions. So seeing in nature, the individual, the egos, feelings and in some sense if you accept that this is how you also view the Brontes then the pathetic fallacy applies because the characters sort of impress their own feelings on nature and nature becomes a, an external symbol of the internal complications storms that are going on within the characters. I think it's also just worth briefly pausing on the fact that these are all happening quite close together in terms of time. You know, it's only less than 10 years between the, uh, these, idea of, these ideas of pathetic fallacy being articulated and having works like the Brontes be published. Very essentially then for Virginia Woolf, the meaning of Charlotte Bronte's work and Emily Bronte's work is rather a mood than a particular observation. So the meaning of their texts is about creating a mood. Virginia Woolf then goes on to compare what she thinks is the fundamental difference between Charlotte Bronte and Emily Bronte. And she even says, Wuthering Heights is a more difficult book to understand than Jane Eyre because Emily was a greater poet than Charlotte. And I was talking about uh, the poetical before and that idea of the unfathomable and Po the, the poetical being describing that mysterious, sublime something that we give the word poetical to. And Wolf here is using that same term to say that fundamentally, Emily is more poetical than Charlotte, which is why Wuthering Heights is fundamentally more poetical than Jane Eyre. Wolf continues, when Charlotte wrote, she said with eloquence and splendour and passion, I love, I hate, I suffer. Her experience, though more intense, is on a level with our own. So despite everything that I've just said about real life and going outside the bounds of ordinary people, etc., what Wolf is saying here is that, that there is still some sense of real life that Charlotte Bronte's novels involve a kind of heightened reality, but 
they still operate recognisably within some kind of recognisable world. But for Wolf, Emily Bronte had a greater scope and a greater ambition, she calls it, than that. But there is no I in Wuthering Heights. There are no governesses, there are no employers. That's the idea of the kind of heightened reality. So Jane Eyre is about a governess and we can see the power dynamics of Rochester and Jane Eyre as governess and Blanche Ingram and so on. But in Wuthering Heights, there are no governesses, there are no employers. Employers, again, that's, you know, a kind of relationship and power dynamic that operates in the real world. There is love, but it is not the love of men and women. Emily was inspired by some more general conception. So it's not the love of recognisable men and women of particular individuals, it's some broader conception of love and hate and suffering, if we go back to what Wolf said about Charlotte Bronte. The impulse which urged her, Emily, to create was not her own suffering or her own injuries. She looked out upon the world, cleft into gigantic disorder and felt within her the power to unite it in a book. That gigantic ambition is to be felt throughout the novel. A struggle, half thwarted but of superb conviction, to say something through the mouths of her characters, which is not merely I love or I hate, but we, the whole human race, and you, the eternal powers. The sentence remains unfinished. So Emily Bronte, according to Virginia Woolf, is trying to say something beyond humanity about the universe. Love, life, joy as abstract terms almost, rather than as experienced or filtered through a particular character or a particular individual. That she tries to articulate suffering as an abstract concept or love as an abstract concept, or hate as an abstract concept. And she cites the quotation from chapter 16. This is where um, Catherine, Kathy Earnshaw has died and Nellie Dean is kind of reflecting on, on death. So Wolf says that in the presence of the dead, I see a repose that neither earth nor hell can break, and I feel an assurance of the endless and shadowless hereafter, the eternity they have entered, where life is boundless in its duration, and love in its sympathy, and joy in its fullness. It is this suggestion of power underlying the apparitions of human nature, and lifting them up into the presence of greatness, that gives the book its huge stature among other novels. This is fundamentally for Wolf, Emily Bronte's genius, that she articulates something beyond the mere human. And that even though she doesn't necessarily answer the question, she, she asks the question. She's trying to say something about we, the whole human race, and you, the eternal powers, even if that remains unfinished, the sentence isn't, closed, the answer isn't given, she's still asking those questions, that ambition is everywhere for Wolf throughout the novel and that's why Wuthering Heights has such a huge stature among other novels because it has this ambition to be bigger than the mere human. For Virginia Woolf, Emily Bronte's characters are unlike us, but that they're unlike real people, but that's part of understanding what the novel is about. Emily's, Emily Bronte's characters might be impossible, Wolf writes, in terms of realism, but they are so full of gusto, so full of um, a kind of vital quality, they are so vivid that they transcend reality. How, we are allowed to ask, can there be truth or insight or the finer shades of emotion in men and women who so little resemble what we have seen ourselves? But even as we ask it, 
we see in Heathcliff the brother that a sister of genius might have seen. So a sister of genius, that term already sort of puts Emily Bronte outside of the ordinary. If you are a poetical genius as Wolfe sees Bronte, then you wouldn't look at a, a, a character or a figure like Heathcliff with the eyes of an ordinary person. So we see the character of Heathcliff through the eyes of an otherworldly poetical genius. And so, of course, of course Heathcliff doesn't resemble a person in real life because he's being described by someone who is themselves poetical and otherworldly. He is impossible, we say, but nevertheless, no boy in literature has a more vivid existence than his. So he, a more vivid, a more life, a more full of life existence than his, even though he is impossible. So it is with the two Catherines. Never could women feel as they do or act in their manner. So they're utterly unlifelike, we say. All the same, they are the most lovable women in English fiction. Now, I'm not sure I agree with Wolf on that particular bit. I don't find them lovable at all myself. But I can see what she means about them having a kind of vivid energy, which makes them seem alive or seem full of energy, even if they don't act as we do or feel as we do. They aren't like ordinary people. Essentially, then, for Virginia Woolf, Emily Bronte creates writing that lives beyond mere facts and reality and creates a truth beyond the real and the tangible, a greater realism than what might actually exist in the real world. So Wolf closes by saying, it is as if she could tear up all that we know human beings by and fill these unrecognisable transparencies with such a gust of life that they transcend reality. Hers, then, is the rarest of all powers. She could free life from its dependence on facts, so that there's something living in her novel that is beyond real life. With a few touches, indicate the spirit of a face so that it needs no body. By speaking of the moor, make the wind blow and the thunder roar. For Virginia Woolf then, I think we can say that Emily Bronte describes a truth about being alive, divorced from the realities of living. Thank you very much indeed for watching. Remember, if you like what I do here on my channel where I analyse classic literature and even sometimes analyse an analysis of classic literature as I have done today, then do please subscribe. And if you've enjoyed the video, then do please press the like button. It does help me out, as I've said many times before, in YouTube's algorithm. And I'd love to know your thoughts on Virginia Woolf's assessment of Emily Bronte and Charlotte Bronte. Do you agree with her? Do you think that her assessment fails in any way? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below.